بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The battle is about to be over and the result was obvious The year is the second year of Hijra The day is the 17th of Ramadan 14 years exactly after the first revelation of the Quran. This is the Battle of Badr. Umayy ibn Khalaf, just before he was killed, he was asking Abdurrahman ibn Auf, who's this great warrior who has the feather of, of an ostrich on his head? He told them, this is Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. The Prophet's uncle, he said, that man did wonders in us. He killed so many of us. And that is why Hamza was on the hit list of the people of Quraysh. As we will hear, inshallah, as we go on to the Battle of Uhud, the number of people that the Quraysh's had in their mind to kill. Now, we have to understand that 300 men cannot beat 1,000 men alone. No matter how brave they were, still the quantity, the, um, the amount is far greater than the quality. So was it their bravery that won them the battle? Was it the luck? Well, in Islam, we do not believe in luck. It's all preordained by Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet ﷺ spent the night praying to Allah to grant him victory. So he supplicated. And also, he took the means for winning. He organized the army. He gave them instructions what to do and what not to do. And also, he sought the support of Allah. Just before the battle took place, he took a handful of sand and uh, sm small stones and he threw it on the direction of the people, saying that your faces are destroyed and mutilated. May Allah make that happen today. Just as the, 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 the war was being, taking place, Allah Azza wa Jal sent 1,000 of his angels. Among them was the archangel Jibra'il, Gabriel. And they came and participated in the fight. And one would ask, this is strange. Why would angels participate? And why 1,000 of them? Wouldn't Gabriel would suffice? Him alone could have won the, not all the, this battle, but the battle of tens of millions of soldiers. The answer would be, it's true. But Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to show the Muslims that they were not on their own. And Allah Azza wa also wanted to show the angels that He is the one who grants the victory. So their participation was symbolic because one strike of an angel could have annihilated the whole army. Their participation was there, it was symbolic, it was to comfort the Muslims. And that is why it was reported in different hadiths that the prisoner, prisoners would say, this man did not capture me, he did not arrest me, it was a different man, I don't see him here, all in white. And the man from Al-Ansar said, says to the Prophet, Prophet of Allah, I, I caught him, I arrested him. And the Prophet says, do not talk, it was an angel from the third heaven coming to do so. And also an, an, another story where one of the Muslims was running after one of the mushrikeen, one of the polytheists, and then he heard a sound saying, Haizum, go forward. And Haizum is the name of a horse. And he didn't see anything. Who was saying this? And he heard the whip of a, a, a lash, the sound of a whip. And then all of a sudden, the man in front of him fell on his face, all in green. So someone else killed him. I heard also the, the angels, the, one of the miracles of the battle where some of the Sahabas reported that uh, they just saw people 
necks just falling apart and his body's just dropping. It's true. Yeah, this, this is true. This took place. And what about the casualties? 70 of the prominent leaders of Quraysh died. And 70 were captured and were prisoners of war. The battle was soon over. And all the arrogance that Quraysh came with was fallen into pieces. And they had to flee the battlefield in defeat and shame. And they went back to Mecca. Now it was time to deal with the current situation. The Prophet ﷺ ordered those who died from the Muslims to be buried as they were. And in Islam, a martyr, a person who dies in the battlefield in the cause of Allah جل, is not washed and is not wrapped in kafan. He's wrapped in his own clothes as he is. And we do not pray the funeral prayer on him. He's just buried as he is. But we cannot say that he is a martyr. We say that he died at the cause of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal alone can determine if he is a martyr or not. Because if we say someone is a martyr, is a shaheed, this means that we are granting him paradise. Yes. It's, it's a, 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 bl a blank check of him that he is in, in paradise. And this is something no one can guarantee except Allah Azza wa Jal or the Prophet وسلم, who is ordered and instructed by Allah. Uh, what about groups that say that, that they are martyred for Islam and, and they are shaheed for Islam and these causes, is that not, how do we justify this statement? Well, this, this is a, a common mistake and Umar ibn Khattab as reported in Sahih al-Bukhari said do not say martyrs because if you say martyrs this means you're saying that they're in Jannah and Allah Azza wa knows alone who's in Jannah. So they just say they, they died in the cause of Allah. And if they're martyr or not, this is something that only Allah knows. And it's, it's a, a common... Yes? It's a hope, isn't it? it? Hope is different than labeling. Hmm. So you can say, we hope and pray that he's a martyr. But you do not say he is a martyr. And so many times we hear in the news, especially in Arabic, and they say that three were killed by... Israeli fire, gunfire, and they were martyred. Boy, you cannot say this, because we don't know if they're martyrs or not. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu when he was approached by one of his companions, and he said, O Prophet of Allah, a person among us dies for bravery, so that people can say he's a brave warrior. And another one dies for glory and honor. And another one dies for the loots and the money we, uh, and the bounty we get from the battlefield. So which one among them is a martyr? Look, it's, it's a very critical question. So the Prophet answers, whomever dies in the cause of Allah. Whomever dies to make the word of Allah the highest. So the previous three are not at the cause of Allah, so they are not martyred. And when you see people die in the battlefield, they all die the same way. But their intention is way different. And this is why it's the difference between hypocrites and Muslims are with the intention. Though the, the acts and the actions themselves are similar. It, it would make sense for me uh, to understand now that it's too hard for human being or for just creations. And end of the day we are just slaves to Allah. That we can tell about someone, so and so, his sins good for giving and he's in heavens now or he's in paradise because I heard that like you know some sorts of groups or like in Christianity basically I heard that they like some people they have the ability as they say or that as they claim that they can give one paradise or can put another in a fire yeah this is this is not the case in Islam no one can say a person is in paradise or is not and that is why we mentioned this earlier, Uthman ibn Mad'un, the companion of the Prophet and amongst the very first to migrate to Medina. He had the lady that he was staying at her house, 
because you remember when the, uh, the, uh, the people of uh, uh, Mecca migrated to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ associated each member with his brother from Medina, from the Ansar, so they became brothers. So he stayed with this family, Uthman ibn Mad'un. When he died, as he was lying dead, the Prophet came وسلم, to visit and to mourn and to bury him. She said, I testify by Allah, that Allah Azza wa has honored you and that you have been forgiven. So the Prophet says, Alaihissalam, how do you know that? He objected. So she said, by Allah, if by, I, I, I seek Allah's forgiveness. If Uthman is not forgiven, who is then? If Uthman ibn Mad'un, the companion, your companion, your loved one, the one who was so close to you, is not forgiven, who then? So the Prophet Sallallahu corrected her by saying, I wish and I hope that he is in the clear and that Allah Azza wa Jal has forgiven his sins and put him in paradise. But it's I myself, I don't know what Allah will do of me. This is a lesson for us not to be certain that Allah will forgive our sins because if you're certain, then you can do whatever you want. Okay, so Shaykh, what about the people which they use uh, th that sentence basically, which uh, that Allah is the most forgiving and Allah has the and Allah is the most, most merciful, and they give themselves excuse to commit sins all the time, and they say yeah because end of end of the day Allah is gonna forgive us. Well, this hadith answers them because the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, says I don't know what Allah is going to do with me. Mm -hmm. So if the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam does not guarantee, he knows. Allah Azza wa has forgiven his previous and coming sins. But at the same time, he is fearful. Because we are the creations of, uh, uh, the creatures of Allah. Allah created us. And we cannot judge Allah. We cannot question Allah. So we do our best and hope for the best. But this does not mean that we do not fear Allah to the extent that we balance our fear with our hope. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned. Inshallah, we'll be right back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The battle is over. The mushrikun, the polytheists, have fled and ran. 70 imprisoned and 70 dead. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ started with was to bury the Muslims who died in the battlefield and there were about 10 to 14 of them. He buried them in their garments. He did not pray the funeral, uh, uh, funeral uh, prayer. And this shows you one of the beautiful things in Islam. Islam is a very easy religion. It's a simple religion that is. In the sense of whenever you need something most, it becomes extremely easy. It's like air and water. We need air more than water. And that's why air is everywhere. Water, we need it, but not as much. That's why you have to put a little bit effort to get it. Likewise, marriage, death, it occurs all the time. In Islam, marriage is the easiest thing because you need it. You go to the garden of a woman you want to mar marry and if there is mutual acceptance, the father says, I give you my daughter in marriage with a dowry of so-and-so in the presence of two or more witnesses. You say, I accept. And she accepts. That's it. She's your wife. No need for a wedding. No need for parties. Well, the sunnah is that you slaughter a sheep and you feed the guests as form of a party. And this is too much. Also, dying. Dying happens a lot in Islam. We grieve for our dead. We mourn for them. But it is not an endless process. If a person dies, immediately the sunnah is to wash him and then to clean him, perfume him, wrap him up in white clothes and then take him to the masjid, take him to the mosque, pray the funeral prayer, which is four times you say Allahu Akbar, no bowing, no prostration, and then carry him to his grave, put him in his grave, Bury him. End of story. I, I once went to a f funeral prayer once also. And uh, there was a man who 
he just became a Muslim and uh, his relatives were still non-Muslims and there was just a few Muslims to they came to pray for him maybe about five or six and on the other side there was maybe 40 or 50 people because of his previous life and we performed a prayer within five ten minutes and people were quite shocked but when they came they they were throwing a, a ceremony flowers and, and, and bringing bottles and saying we miss you and it took some of their time but they were actually amazed with the way we it was like a form of dawah also of course of course and they're astonished because those who are in grief are also not related to him those who, who are co coming to mourn are not related to him they are coming seeking the reward of Allah because one of the brothers actually died and we remember the good things and they remember the bad things they're coming with the bottles with their uh, 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 flowers and with so on uh, and you can see in so many funerals they're celebrating wine is is, is uh, given away and people are fully and nicely dressed they, may, they have a party afterwards and some of the funerals would come with a big convoy of cars and it costs a lot and the headstone costs so much you have to engrave on it and also some of them uh, are followed by a, a musical band and so on this is completely Completely un-Islamic. In Islam, he's dead. May Allah have mercy on his soul. End of story. If you are a relative, you're allowed to mourn for three days, not more. If you are a wife, you have to mourn for four months and ten days. And this is only for the wife. With, of course, the conditions, which is, this is not the place to discuss. So the Prophet ﷺ had the Muslims buried. In normal occasions you would normally abandon your enemy on the ground. Why honor them? Why bury them? They're your enemy. But this is not the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ never passed a dead corpse without burying it. And he tells us that to honor a dead person, you have to bury him. But, of course, because they were not Muslims, so the rituals connected and uh, 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 with the Muslim barrier is different than the non-Muslims. Non-Muslims are not allowed to be buried in Muslim graveyards or with a Muslim. Non-Muslims are not to be washed or to be uh, prayed upon because this prayer is a form in, of intercession to Allah to forgive their sins. So you do not intercede for non-Muslims. So we can't ask uh, Allah for forgiveness for disbelief a person then oh, we can? No, you cannot. It mm. is forbidden for a Muslim to ask Allah for forgiveness for a non-Muslim. And this was manifested clearly in the hadith which was reported by Imam Muslim in Sahih where the Prophet Sallallahu mm. once cried. So the companions asked him, why are you crying? So he said, I asked Allah to allow me, to give me the permission to ask for forgiveness for my mother, and he did not grant me that. So I asked him if I can visit her grave, and he allowed me to do that. This means that, and also it's reported, or it's uh, mentioned in uh, uh, the Quran, that it is not for the believers to ask Allah for mercy for the None, or for the disbelievers, you cannot, even if they were relatives and close ones to you. So, this is crystal clear. So the Prophet ﷺ came to the dead bodies, and he ordered them, the companions, to throw them in one of the wells and bury them. And he stayed there, the Prophet ﷺ, for three days in Badr. So, to prove to the people, that he did not win and he left. No, he won and he stayed. Anyone who wants to rebattle again, we're, we're there, we're ready. And at the end of these three days, the Prophet ﷺ went to the prominent 24 of the mushrikun, of the polytheists who were buried. And he came to them and he started calling them names. O Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. Al-Walid ibn Utbah, 
Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham, and so on. He, uh, Umayy ibn Khalaf, Ubayy ibn Khalaf, and, and so on. He started mentioning, the, mentioning them one by one. And he said to them, We have found what Allah Azza wa had promised us. Have you found what Allah Azza wa promised you? He's talking to the, to the dead. He's talking now. And you mentioned, Sheikh, you mentioned the name Utbah ibn Abi Rabi'ah. Utba ibn Rabi'ah. Utba ibn Rabi'ah. Yes. Uh, yeah, which uh, we heard earlier that you said to us that uh, he objected basically in the beginning of the battle to go True. there. Then they changed his mind. So could we learn a lesson from that, that sometimes, you know, a person which he could have mind, but because his friends could uh, stray him or lead him to stray, could change him. So that it's a lesson for us not to go with bad people then? Of course, bad company is bad influence. We are told in the Quran that on the day of judgment, a man would come and bite his hand in regret, saying, I wish I followed the Prophet ﷺ. I wish I did not obey my friend who was with me 24 hours, my buddy, because he himself had thrown me into hellfire. We have so many incidents that the influence of the peers did this to the people. It threw them into hell. Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, his beloved uncle who protected him, who raised him, who took custody of him after the death of his grandfather Abdul Muttalib and the father of uh, Abu Talib and he loved him more than he loved his own children he protected him throughout the years the whole 10 years in Mecca he protected him and he tried his best not, that no one would harm him he, the Prophet ﷺ tried his best to call him into Islam and on the bed uh, uh, of death while Abu Talib was dying the Prophet came to him and told him, Oh, uncle, say a word that I would intercede at the side of Allah for you with it. Only say, La ilaha illallah. Say that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. That's all. And next to him was Abu Jahl and someone else. Next to his bed. And they're saying, Abu Talib, are you going to abandon the religion of your father, Abdul Muttalib, and your ancestors? Are you going to disobey them? Are you going to go astray from their way and path? Then the Prophet says, Oh, uncle, just say it. Please say it. And at the end, the last thing he said before he died was that he was still on the, the, the religion of Abdul Muttalib. And he died as a non-Muslim. So, look at the influence of the peers on Abu Talib. And, and there are so many incidents. All of these mushriks were influenced by one way or the other. Not all of them wanted to go, but their arrogance, their unex uh, readiness to accept Islam made them end in this tragic way. And this is an end that they deserve. It's what your hand did. So no one can blame, you cannot blame anyone else for that. They say, yeah, so close, but still so far. Yeah. They, they almost came. Oh, almost, this close. And there are so many of them came to the, their, their peers and said, by Allah, what Muhammad is saying is not of this world. No way. Anyone. We know the poets. We know the ways of literature. We are the masters of the language. This Quran is not from this world. And it cannot come from an illiterate person. And with so many, well, this we know now, with so many scientific facts that were only recognized 30 or 50, 40 or maximum 50 years ago. The Prophet ﷺ, 14 centuries, came with facts. And it's not like, what's the name of the, the book, Astronomus or Astrodomus or whatever? Astronomus. Yeah, no, no, the, the book of this guy who made prophecies and, 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 and came with a book of prophecies. Uh, he told so many prophecies, some of them came true and lots of them were false. Yeah, that's the one. I always forget his name. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ came with facts, with theories, and none of them was proven wrong. And this is a very big difference. I believe that this is all the time we have for today's program. So, inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.